Okay, we, uh, we're starting. And uh, I welcome you. We, oh, I forgot to send to my people online this lesson. Well, that's the first sin of the day. There you yes. go. <laughs> so, I did, I did, I forgot to send the people online. They can open their Bibles and look at it. What? They can open their Bibles they can. and look at it. I mean, they don't, we're not, yeah. <laughs> they but they might need the reminder, or they might think I'm doing it. Oh, well. It is what it is at this point. I apologize. I will, uh, I will rectify that after the class. Um... What kind of focus sense? We, we obviously need to pray for Pastor Carl because he has like two bumps on his plate here. Yeah, I was just told one of my dear friend's son in his early 20s is diagnosed with lymphoma. Ooh, God. So they're just starting that process. Okay. Wow, that's bad. Well, good. Well, hopefully, hopefully it's something we can treat. His name's Scott. Scott? Pray for Scott with lymphoma. Lymphoma? Lymphoma. Um, who else? Well, Lois and continued healing. Lois continued healing. There were other people you wish you'd see. Yeah, we have a lot of people healing right now, that's Jack for sure. And Reggie and Roberta and Jack Pat and Pam Scott and Scott and Judy. Judy Hodge. Judy Hodge, uh -huh. Judy's not doing well with the flyer. Yeah, Judy's still very critical, that's for sure. Still on a ventilator? Still on a ventilator and starting to fight it now, too. So. Yeah. Well, they, they take them off as early as they can, and they don't want to be So we'll keep Judy in our prayers and her family who's gathered around her. Um, and it's looking tough, that's for sure. And uh, and then uh, Jack is going to Tuscany Gardens and he's um, uh, for rehab and 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 he might be in palliative care right now then too. Yeah. And uh, so we'll, we'll see we'll see what the journey looks like for Jack, but um, but it's a tough space for them too. And um, that's about everybody. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll we'll say prayer now. Lord, we lift up um, we lift up everybody that we know that's fighting cancer, especially this morning. We pray for Scott um, as he begins this journey. Uh, Donna's uh, Donna's family's friend. Uh, help this young man be strong, Lord. Give wisdom and empathy to the doctors and nurses and therapists and aides that are journeying with him. Give patience and care and love for his family. We pray for all those that are healing right now. We just name them all in the midst of this conversation. We pray for Lois, who isn't here with us healing. We pray for um, Reggie and Scott and Roberta and Markham. We pray for um, and we pray for Judy Hodge and her family as they gather around with Judy, it's just so critical, Lord, right now, fighting COVID. Um, we give time to have other names said aloud. We hear these prayers, Lord. We love you with all of our heart. Amen. Amen. A good report we prayed for my sister a couple weeks ago, and she did, came out of her testing with Pretty good results. So we got good answers to those prayers. Oh, good. My sister doesn't believe in God. But... Okay. There you go. <laughs> the um, well, good. Carol said that her sisters uh, uh, got good results on her prayers. From her prayers. Hey. Oh, and um, prayers for um, Diane Keller's family. She passed away. Well, that's Kathy. That's Kathy McFerrin's cousin. That's what she just said. That's oh, Kathy. You said that. Okay. Donna, Kathy said that's your cousin. So she, which was part of this too that I'm trying to read. And Kathy and Lisa 
Well, at least I don't think I send you this, but Kathy, I usually send this out. But we're doing Romans 1, 18 to 32. And I apologize, I just lost, I just lost track of sending it out. But there's nothing on here except the questions I'm going to ask anyway, so you're not missing much. So Romans 1, 18 to 32, if you want to open up your Bible for this today. Hi, Joyce. Romans 1, 18 to 32 is what we're studying. Um, and we'll get started on this, too. Um, you ready? I'm just kind of settling myself here. This is me settling myself. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. Let me practice what we're doing here first. So imagine a courtroom, and this is Paul making an opening statement to the courtroom, to the jurors, okay? So he is, he, he's making his case, and so this is, this is kind of that indictment. This is, this is the charges we have against uh, the accused, okay? So here we go. Maybe I'll shut that. Don, you want to shut that door when you get done? For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness. For those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things that he has made so that they are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being or birds or four-footed animals or reptiles. Therefore God gave them over to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshiped and served the Creator rather than the, the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way also their men gave up natural intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own person the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind and to things that should not be done. And they were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, covetedness, malice. They were full of envy and murder and strife and deceit, craftiness. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious towards parents. They are foolish and faithless and heartless and ruthless. They know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. Yet they not only do them, but they either even applaud others who do them. That's harsh. Yeah. That felt great. Yeah. Yeah, that, was, that was quite an opening statement. Uh, so, so who's on trial here? Who's the one who's being indicted? And, and your choices are Jew or Greek. So you got 50% chance of being right. And 50% chance of being wrong. And 50% <laughs> chance of being wrong. Jew or Greek, what, what do you think? I would think both. Nope, it's one or the other. I'd go Greek. I'd go with Greek. Oh, you guys win. Greek. That's right. It is Greek. Yeah, he, in, in two, in the middle of chapter two, he's going to... He's going to bring in Jewish people. So he starts with the Greek. And, and, the, and the way we know that he's talking about Greeks in this is because he's talking about people who 
Like verse three, I think is the or well the third verse. Um, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Um, his theory is, is that even though God hasn't gathered them to be God's people, the way Jewish people know God is because God revealed God's self to Abraham, remember? And then told Abraham that his descendants were going to be, and everyone's a descendant of Abraham, you know, Jewish sort of family. And that's the, how the people of God... But for everybody else, God didn't. There's not, you know, a hundred different Abrahams that we know of, but, you know, for every different culture. And so, and so, what Paul wants to say is that even though God did not pull you up and make you a special people, you know God exists simply by living in the world and seeing what God has done. Okay? So that's, so that's his argument there. <clears throat> that though God is invisible, verse 20, right? They have understood through the things he has made. Okay? And so later philosophers on Christianity would, would say similar sort of things. That you can get to God just simply by observing the creation. And, uh, and then logically pondering that there's got to be a first force, right? There's got to be a first move. There's got to be a creator for all the stuff that's created. Does that make sense? So that, that's his argument. That's his, that's his argument as he starts as he starts with these guys about, about this. And he says that, um, that even though they knew that there was some sort of creator, they didn't honor God or give thanks to God. So even though they had a sense that there was something behind the world, uh, they didn't ask any other questions beyond that, and they didn't search beyond that. Um, and uh, and then he takes kind of a, a, a Jewish dig at them, you know, <laughs> that uh, because remember these famous philosophers that, that that we still study today and are kind of the heart of of human understanding. You know, Socrates and Aristotle and Plato. Um, those people were already 100 years in the, in the grave when Paul was around. They're, they were famous sort of philosophy uh, uh, bedrocks in Paul's day. I mean, they were celebrated. So, so, so the, the heart of how the human mind works or how people interact, you know, you think you're so wise, but yet you miss this basic key. And because you miss this basic key, it, it makes all of your life go sideways. So you act like fools. So you, you've, you've got all this knowledge, but, but, but it's worthless to you if, if you don't have this beginning, this creator. And, um, and, and then he points out, he points out what, what's, what Socrates and Aristotle and Plato pointed out when they were around, uh, that, that people worship stupid things. And, uh, you yeah, know, four-legged creatures. And so that wasn't lost on these great philosophers. Uh, but, but it was also wasn't lost on Jewish kind of philosophers, too, which Paul's kind of in that camp at this point. Does any, any of that make sense? Any of that sound right? That, that's his argument. And, um, and so, <clears throat> you know, what kind of names do we have for... Because uh, we, we often make this argument, don't we? That, that, that you just got to know that God... Uh, that God exists because what, what are the what are the ways we say that now when we when we're talking to people or or we've heard other people say what do they point to? Looking at God's creation, a lot of times people say you know that you're God because you just look at. Yeah, what are the things they point to, Carol, when they look at God's creation? Oh, they point to things like ma mountains and the beauty of nature and. So yeah, because maybe kind of the grandeur and uh, and the beauty, and that there's got to be some sort of painter behind this artistic, uh, this artistic uh, vista that we have in front of us. What else? I always think of the way babies develop, and, and, and you know, I mean, we as humans, they come up with a brain and all this stuff mm -hmm. that we, you know, it can't come from anywhere else. 
Yeah, so kind of the intricacies and the complications of, of yeah, of, of this one, you know, this sperm meeting an egg and, and then, you know, and then things attaching to the uterine wall and, and you know, finding life there and, and being able to grow. And, um, you know, I listened to a uh, science podcast when I was coming back and forth from our cottage and, uh, and, and it was, it was just really interesting just how the uterine wall robs food from from the mother in order to in order to feed and the body's fighting it that's why the mother's sick because the body doesn't want to be have food robbed so it was a so it, it was told just that it's a wonderful story of, of how this was going on and yeah and yeah and so that's the kind of thing that makes you step back and you know just all the parts of an eye and how an eye has to be able to see and, and communicate yeah, so so you you know you go to the top of the mountain and you get a sense of God, or you or you pick up a science journal and you get a sense of God. That surely there's got to be something smarter than us behind all this. That, that simple randomness can't be can't be behind it, right? I think I think that's that's kind of how most. And so that that's where Paul's kind of starting. Like, people know that's this there, and uh, but yet you don't honor God or give thanks to that creator. And then his best charge here is verse 25. Um, that you worship the creature rather than the created. So that's this kind of bedrock Christian theology right there, right? <laughs> right? I mean, that's, that's the heart of sinfulness. And sinfulness is anything that keeps us away from God, which is the creator. That the things we put up instead of God are always going to be creature rather than creator. And that's just life. These people are going to be thinking about what's happening right here in front of them. How they're dealing with other people. We rarely do any of us, I think, take time to pause. And I don't know when was the last time I thought about the grandeur of a mountain range. Maybe when I was viewing one. Yeah. I was looking at the Alps, but I don't pause often to do that or think about the amazing universe or how our bodies work. We are dealing with people every day and troubles, problems. Yeah. So what Carol said, I'm going to sum it up, is that is that our eyes are often down here, <laughs> looking this way rather than up there, looking looking up. So we so even though we're on a mountain, we're not necessarily taking in the view. And, uh, and even, even though we're aware, you know, that our eyes aren't, that our eyes are, are miraculous because we're losing our eyesight, uh, you know, we're, we're, we, we lose track of that. Yeah. And so, and so in relationship, then we, we, we tend to put more emphasis on those relationships than this relationship because, because this stuff, it takes up more of our time. Um, and so what Paul's going to say is that, when when we don't we're not doing this stuff, then this stuff gets all convoluted and it gets misrepresented. And so that's going to be the heart of his that's going to be the heart of his argument right there. The um, and so what has God done to make it even worse for them before the final day of judgment? <laughs> yeah. So, what do you think that means? That's exactly the right verse, Pat. Good job. Yeah. So, what 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 do you think gave him up to degrading passions? The gave him up part, not the degrading passions part. He he, he outlines the degrading passions quite a bit yes, here. Yes. We, we can get to that. But what's the giving them up mean? What what, what do you think Paul means by that? What's that called? You're right, Carol. He lets them follow their, their ways. What's that called? Free will. There you go. There you go. That, that was the churchy term. Yeah. Right? So that's called free will, right? So I had a seminary professor that said um, in class that our um, that God's judgment is free will. Right? That, yeah, that, that, God, <laughs> that God's judgment is to, you know what? If you're going to screw up your life, screw up your life. It makes me sad. It makes me weep in heaven. Uh, but uh, but my my 
my, my judgment is to allow you to spin out of control if that's what you're choosing to do. Yeah, we always look at free will as a, a positive thing, yeah. but it's a gift that we were given that right. Yeah, and so, and so the theory is, so what Pat says, you're always looking at free will as a, as a gift rather than a punishment. And uh, and so, yeah, so the theory is, is that God wants true relationship with us. And the only way any of us can have true relationship is if it is freely given. So just as we can give free, so the gift is that we are, in, we are free to love God. <laughs> we're not robots, we're not, uh, you know, we're not instinctual. I mean, it, it, it's something we choose to do. But in giving us that gift of choice, God also needs to allow us the gift not to love God. And, comes and not to cherish gift, what God gives us. With the gift of choice comes responsibility. Yep. Amen. Are we, are we experiencing that in the midst of the pandemic? Yeah, that's right? what I was just thinking. Let's yeah. talk about masks. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, with the gift of choice becomes comes that's responsibility. That's in fact, actually, I was having a wonderful conversation with a member who, who, who doesn't want to get the vaccine um, yesterday, an active member. And, uh, and in that conversation, you know, I said, I said, and he was agreeing with me, he was adding to it. I said, then you owe a responsibility to your neighbors to make sure, you know, that, that you are doubly careful about spreading because you are just simply more likely to get it than anyone else. And so, uh, so I mean... Yeah, so as a good part of this congregation, not that the Messiah is anything special, but as a good part of, you know, a person of faith, then he saw that he had this responsibility because I because I can't do this for, for reasons he had, then, then I'm going to have to take responsibility for this. And so that's that's what God hopes for us, right? That in these decisions, we, we follow them out. Um, yeah, so, so just as free will can bring us into lifelong relationships, right? That, that, that enrich us, free will can also break up right. <laughs> our relationships uh, and, and, and pervert our relationships. Now, if you use an overly sexual term, because Paul is very sexualized in this, um, but, uh, but pervert is probably a good way. I mean, it distorts it, you know, it, it makes it something that it's not supposed to be. I think we take free will too far and we think that it's our right to do. It starts to be, and we think it's our right to do whatever we choose to do. And we make the decision. Screw everybody else. Yeah. I'm not just talking about the pandemic. We're just in general. Yeah, and, and so Luther had a line that, you know, that I am. Was it Luther? Or was it Paul? I'm, I'm free. Oh, shoot. Now I'm going to screw it up. It's gone for me. I, I, think, it, I think it's in the Babylon book that Luther said that I'm. Uh, free to be slave for all, or something like that. But it might have been Paul that said that. If Pat, it's Pat said the names of the responsibility parts. Uh, Kathy, yeah. Kathy's encouraging people to get their vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Lois joined; she'd been looking for us. Um, so, um, yeah. So I would. Uh, <coughs> so, so that, that's so that's the that's God's judgment. God's judgment. So, so the men on Tuesday, you know, had problems. Well, I thought God didn't let anybody go. So Paul's not at the gospel yet, right? So if you remember the gospel, the gospel is, is that the world is so broken, right? You can all agree with this. The world is so broken. I mean, that, that's the gospel message. And that God's plan to save the world is through the revelation of Jesus. It's through Jesus' what Jesus reveals about a new world, a new way of being, a new king. So, so this is the world's broken part. <laughs> so, so God, uh, and, and so Paul's making his case here at the beginning that the world is broken. And, and, who, can, and, and who can deny it? Okay, and so he's, he's brushing with really broad strokes, right? <coughs> and then he... Um, and, and so a lot of this language is kind of, from what I understand from reading in, uh, from reading NP8 in preparation for this, a lot of this is kind of typical Jewish moralist writings of Paul's day. So this was this was the critique of the Greek culture around them. This is why you don't want to let your children go to Greek schools, Jewish mothers. You know you want because this is this is what they so. 
So th this isn't really plowing new ground anywhere. The new ground is that usually those Jewish moralists in Paul's day when they talked about the Greeks, and I'm using the word Greeks like Paul does just to mean everyone who's not Jewish, okay? Or the wider culture. You might want to say the American culture and that, you know, if, if you're putting this in our language, I suppose. Because it probably means more culture than it means um, everybody. But anyways, so usually it means that that's why we got to stay Jewish because because that's this is the only ship that's going to save us uh, because the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Okay? So what Paul's going to say differently that we know is that God's intention is to save these people who have free will that are choosing to ignore God and not give thanks to God. So that's, so that's going to be the difference here. But this language isn't that different for a Jewish philosopher moralist of Paul's day. Does that make sense? Okay. And then, then he gives kind of a laundry list right there of uh, at the end. You know, and it just keeps going on and on of all the sort of things. It's like, it, you know, it's almost like he had partners in there that were giving him more words to write. Yes. Or, you know, say, oh my goodness. Uh, I forgot this. Yeah, I know. He pretty much, he pretty much uh, gets a lot of them, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of them you can see in the Ten Commandments, and some of them, some of them are, um, well, can you generalize the, not that we're going to look at specifically at 26, 27 about homosexuality in a minute here, but can you generalize the list at all, or, or make some generalities, what, what kind of things seem to be, what kind of categories seem to be in the list, especially? It's harming your neighbor. Yeah, a lot of it is relationship. Maybe all of it is relationship stuff. Relational, right? Really good insight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because as we were talking earlier, you know, if a, uh, our, our role is to have this relationship done right before we get into this relationship. And this is the ways that this relationship gets, to use the word again, perverted, gets distorted, gets, um, yeah. And there are a whole lot of ways of harming our neighbors. A whole lot of ways, yeah. <laughs> it, and yeah. It, it, it can go on forever, which, mm -hmm. as you're reading it, you run out of breath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to put, I had to break it up and put some they are's in there and everything else just to make it read a little easier. Um, yeah. Any, any other thoughts about what they seem especially about? A lot of self-centeredness is what I thought too. A lot of it is, a lot of it is focused on on your own good rather than your neighbor's good. Insolent and haughty and boastful. Right? Gossips do that because by making your neighbor sound bad, you're making yourself sound better, right? I mean, yeah. That, that, that's the other thing too. I kind of noticed that a lot of it has to do with. Uh, which maybe is the heart of all sinfulness, right? This is kind of putting your own needs in front of your neighbor's needs. Um, so Paul uses the self selfishness. Yeah, Kathy, Kathy said, try, try again, poor Kathy. She gives like the right answer, and then after we've already, Kathy, I'm sorry, I need to look over constantly. I appreciate, you. I appreciate you because you're like a step ahead of us. Um, so anyways, um, yeah, yeah, just a lot of selfishness, like Kathy said, in the midst of that. Um, okay, and so then he's painting with all these broad strokes. And the only thing he kind of narrows down into in this is homosexuality. Does that seem weird? All right, I mean, you know, we got all these things. He could have described how gossip gossips, but he doesn't do that. What is it like today that sex sells? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you know, there's some real truth to that. One of the one of the big things again from N.T. Wright that Jewish moralists uh, had uh, was sexual. They they were uh, one of the easiest ways to dis distinguish a Jewish moralist from a Greek moralist was the ideas about sexuality. And sex, and uh, so there, so there was definitely, so this would again been part of the culture, 
you know, that you could see. It's sexuality is titillating in, you know, first century Rome, just like it's titillating in, in 21st century America, right? So sex, sex sells, as Pat says. Yeah, so, so even though this list doesn't have a ton of sexual sort of sins in it, the one he decides to unpack a little bit is sexual. Okay, so the ELCA, your denomination, has done a lot of work on Romans 1, 26 to 27. Uh, there's like, and I should have gotten the number right this time, and I'm not, so I'm going to say a number, and it might not be right. There's like 12 or 13 sexual scriptures on, or scriptures that, that seem to reference homosexuality in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, something like that, okay? And, uh, and so, back in the 2000s, 20 years ago, when we were like kind of unpacking what is our relationship going to be to uh, uh, same gender couples and, 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 and people who, uh, people whose sexuality is expressed that way. How, how are we going to, how are we going to live in community? And some of you guys took part in these classes. So one of the things they did was they, they did a, they put together a whole workbook on, on looking at all 13 of those scriptures. And we did that here. Where, where we had a class where we would look at those scriptures and we'd talk about the context of the scripture, what, what what seems to be the prohibition against what kind of act, sex act they were talking about, what's missing here, and you know we had we had a good discussion, and then we wrote in our answers because then they asked us questions, and so the way and. And and, uh, and then the scholars took our input and, and, and they and they sat down and they and, and they created a document in 2009 that said um, basically two things that we're that we don't agree on this <laughs> uh, that uh, that that the majority of the church seems to think that that homosexuality might be a valid way of, of expressing God's God's image and and, and the God's likeness, but, but but a strong minority doesn't like that idea. And the second thing they said was that we could still live in community because we're having a good discussion on it. And the third thing they said, which was the most controversial, is that we're going to allow churches to follow different paths while we live in that community. And that means that churches can ordain, that the church will allow ordained pastors who are in same-gender relationships and, uh, and uh, bishops to be elevated who are in same-gender relationships. And and pastors can do blessings for, for, for same gender relationships. So, so that was a 2009 decision. But at the heart of that decision was this discussion that we had around 2003, 2004 in all of our churches. And again, Messiah was part of that. And this is, this is the hardest scripture if you want to acknowledge that, that God made, that God made uh, sexual beings that might be same gender. Might be homosexual, okay? Because <laughs> the other ones can be discounted pretty quickly because they seem to be talking about um, very specific sort of volatile actions that, that no one would like, like raping. <laughs> you're not allowed to rape your male neighbor <laughs> if you're a man. You know, well, yeah, <laughs> I'm all in. <laughs> no raping of male neighbors, right? I mean, so um, so that sort of thing was. Whereas this one seems to be talking broadly just about this distortion of human relationship that homosexuality is a representative of, which makes really good logical sense that homosexuality is a distortion of human relationship. Because, because again, if we're looking at the top of a mountain, we go, man, it is, or, or better yet, if we're looking at an eye and how an eye all fits together, well, human relationship looks like it kind of fits together too, right? I mean... We got a penis and we got a vagina. I mean, you know, I, mean, I don't need to go the rest of the way on this, but I mean, uh, but these parts fit in. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and you know, and, and how we procreate. You know, I mean, yeah, the, 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 this is you know, you need one and one. You, you know, and and uh, you know, and, and so that that you know that that old saying, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. I mean, you know, these the, 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 this the, this is sort of that logic. You know that that. This, that this looks like God, how God intended the world, and so surely this is how God intended the world. <clears throat> so, so Romans 1, 26 to 27, in that debate, became kind of a centerpiece. And so, um, 
couple people are responding here. Uh, that. <laughs> I think the penis vagina thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sex sells. Right. There you go. Well, one is Joyce, uh, Joyce Vance, uh, and uh, Joyce um, is asking, so what do Lutherans believe about homosexuality? Um, and then uh, Lois said, um, this brings us to what is normal, and she made capitals for normal, right? You know, I was trying to figure out. And, uh, and, and, and then it's capitalized because I think what Lois is saying is that, is that who, who says what is normal is, is usually from where they stand in the world and, and both their power and the way they're raised up. Uh, and what Joyce is, Joyce is, uh, uh, Joyce is Siobhan Grimm's mother, right? I'm pretty sure I got that right. And, uh, and so, um, and not Luther. So, so, so she's wondering, well, Joyce, hang on there. We're going to get there. Okay. Take on to the end. <laughs> we live in now, there's medical proof that genetic changes mm -hmm. in, are what influence your sexuality. Right. And so that really is a choice. I mean, I guess you could be a choice to stay away from what you want. Right. But it can't be sinful if it's the way God created you. Yeah. So what San, Sandy said is that it, it, it feels like medically people are dispositioned to homosexuality. And it, and it doesn't seem to be, it can't be sinful if this is the way God created you. To sum up, I'm just so people can hear. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. If I don't sum up well, let me know, because I just want to make sure that no, people... It's just that, you know, we have so much more knowledge now than we did back when yeah. this Romans thing was written. And so that influences the way we relate to things that are sinful and things that the way God wants wants it to be. I just don't see how that can be just erased. Right. I think, um, yeah, and, and I think that's one of the arguments. And, and there's counter arguments here. I, I, don't, I don't know how far down I want to go down there. But Joyce is Eve and Jessica's grandmother. Jessica Ryder and Eve both. Thanks, Joyce. I apologize that I, I had you at the wrong relation. <laughs> Thanks. And, and Joyce is around all the time. She's praying with us all the time. She comes to worship on Sunday morning and she comes to our class too. So, uh, so I had you at the wrong. Uh, Siobhan and uh, Jessica and even are all they're all the same age and they're all beautiful young women in our church. So, <laughs> so, so I just got that screwed up. The um, okay. So, so here we go. So, so a couple things that are unusual about this text right now is that um, it's the only one in the Bible that has anything mentioned about women when it comes to homosexuality. Now, there is some debate, just to put on your pointy-headed Bible scholar looking, there is some debate on whether Paul is talking about homosexuality for women in here, okay? And, and a, couple of debate, a couple of the debate here is, is that the idea in Paul's day a Jewish idea and a Greek idea, so a cultural idea that was shared, is um, is that the reason people were homosexual is because they had such a lustful passion for sex that they ex they couldn't extinguish it with women. So I, I, I have sex with as many women as possible, and yet I still want more sex. So now I'm looking for men. Anything of you, right? Yeah. So, 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 so the so, so the idea is that you have this too big sex drive, let's say, and and so and so that um and for women, the idea in Paul's day was that women have no sex drive, that women have no desire for sex and take no enjoyment in sex. So normal is for men to have sexual desire for women. They seek the women out and they have sex and that's how babies are made. I'm not telling anything new to anybody, right? And then, and then, the, and, and, and then, then the, uh, and then the second thing is, is, is that women are passive. It would be the, would be the, you know, intellectual word to use for this. Women are passive. And they were expected to be, right? And they were expected to be like passive. Like shadow and just right. used. Right. So, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, and no one really cared whether they enjoyed it or not either, as, as part of the culture too, I think is what you're saying. So there are women exchange natural intercourse for unnatural. <clears throat> okay, so unnatural intercourse for women 
could simply be that they had degrading passion. That they or that they had an orgasm. Or that they had an <laughs> orgasm. Or, or or that they did or that they had they did sexual acts with men that was not accepted sexual acts with men. Okay? It's a it's it, it, it's it's a theory out there that, that scholars debate over whether and the and part of the problems that scholars have with this is that there isn't a lot of evidence of public homosexuality for women in the Greek and Roman culture. So it wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing. Whereas male homosexuality in the Greek Roman culture was a thing. But it looked specifically like this. It was mostly pedastry. Pedestry, pedestry, I think maybe the word how you say the word. <laughs> uh, Joyce says she lives in Sydney, or otherwise she'd be here herself. <laughs> And, uh, and that's where all the Rivers, or not, um, even Jessica's family is from, not the Rivers. Uh, but anyways, um, yeah, so pedestri pedestry, pedestry, I think that's how you say it. Pedestry is where an older man takes a younger boy as his, to receive his sexual pleasures. Okay? So, um, and this, this, this was done by wealthy men in Paul's day where they would take a boy slave and, you know, and then 14, 15, cast him off and then get a new boy slave that they would, that they would. And so that, and the Jewish people found this despicable and they wrote about it in all sorts of places. Um, and, and other cultures and even Greek culture found it despicable too. So it wasn't like Greeks were cheerleading this, but this was happened. And the other thing was male prostitution was was very common in Paul's day. Okay? So you'd have male prostitutes. You'd have male prostitutes in Paul's day. But but there wasn't a lot of female homosexuality. So so that's why scholars are saying, you know, is this what Paul's saying? Because because if you put that plan, you could read it differently when once you have that information. You go, yeah, maybe that is what he's saying. But then he goes on to there. Um, in the same way also the men Giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. So that is the language I just described to you of, of this giving up passion. You know, I, I've spent myself out on women, now I'm going to turn to men. And they considered, they committed shameless acts with men and received their own persons due penalty. What do you think the due penalty for their error is? Sexual disease. I don't think so. It could be. Definitely, we read into it sexual disease, especially in light of the AIDS epidemic, right? Um, and I'm sure there were pastors during the AIDS epidemic that were pointing to this and saying this is exactly what happened. I don't think that's it. Paul's a good Jewish teacher. What's the purpose of sex? Right. And so God made us, and what does God say to us after he, God shows us all the creation in chapter 1? He says, look at all this is yours, now be fruitful and multiply, right? Yeah. So the purpose of sex is to procreate, okay? No matter how many times two men do it, they ain't procreating, okay? <laughs> and, you know, and so, and, so, and so that's important in this day and age. Okay, now we worry about population and things like that. So, uh, so our our responsibility to procreate is, it doesn't seem as important now. But in Paul's day, it was it was a bit important, and you know this because there's all. Why are there all these stories about barren women, women who can't who can't conceive? That's because they're shamed by their culture because they're not take, carrying out their primary responsibility, which is to replace themselves. And you needed to replace yourselves with a lot of people because children died at large numbers. And so, and so probably what their what their punishment is isn't a social punishment like homosexuals were, um, you know, like in our culture where where homosexuals, you know, were, uh, were were put on the margins of society. That's probably not what he's talking about, and it's probably not disease. It's probably procreation. That they couldn't be fruitful and multiply. I have a weird question. Please. What was the purpose of the eunuch? Talking about sex and 
like the harem, or uh, so, they have sex with the women in the harem. They wouldn't be sexual at all, so they couldn't really be. Yeah. So were they forced to be given? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I just I heard of them and know that they existed, never really knew why they were keeping away from the women. Yeah. I think so. I'm not. I'm not an expert, so I probably just go by the movies I watch, and that, that seems to be. <laughs> oh, I don't know, Nick, that's oh, I know, that seems to be the. That uh, seems give to be us the. Your playlist. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, that's probably where I know about so what? 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 Carol asks is, is is where do eunuchs fit into this picture? And uh, so that's that's where we're. That's where we're joking. Yeah. It, it it feels it feels like it was some way to degrade a slave. In, in, in order and then. Um, in order to make him safe around the harem is kind of what I've always understood. And we did talk a little bit about that when we did the, because the eunuch shows up in, in Peter's, in Peter's thing. And, and eunuchs also show up in the Bible as, as a prohibition, that, that, that you can no longer be uh, part of the community. And I'm pretty sure in Deuteronomy, because that's part of the eunuch story in Acts that we had. That, that, you can't be fully Jewish if you don't have all of your parts. The man parts. was on, on the cart on the way to Silver. Right, that was that's a it. That, but he was a very intelligent person, so it could have been also, or could it have been, I guess, a way to control people that were very intelligent, that um, kind of keep them in their place, that you can use their intelligence, but if they if they can't be part of the community, um, then they're bound to their master, so to speak. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you were automatically uh, left outside. Um, yeah, and, and so, yeah, and that's the unit story I'm talking about in the Book of Acts, where he's in the carriage. And what he was, if you remember in the story, he was a wealthy, he was a, um, uh, an advisor to the queen. In a high position. Right, of Ethiopia, right? Wasn't he an advisor to the queen of Ethiopia? Wasn't that who he was? And, uh, yeah, so he was in a high position, and he was intelligent, he was reading, he, and he had wealth, because he was in a carriage, no one had carriages except for really wealthy people, and he was reading in the carriage, for goodness sakes, so, yeah, so, um, yeah, well, that, that's a side note, but, but a way of humiliating him was taking his manhood away from him, so that was, that was part of the whole process. Okay, so, that seems to be what Paul is saying. So what do, um, and, and Lo Lois lifted up something that she thinks about homosexuality here too. And I'll read it for you. Both sexes are born either with what is perceived as natural or what is homosexual. So I think she, either heterosexual or homosexual, I think is what she means. You cannot take the basketball from the seven person. I'm not sure what that means. Lois is on better. <laughs> 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 what kind of drug she's on. <laughs> and, and she says the penalty is being judged, right, at the end of time. And Paul definitely, I mean, thinks Lois. Paul is definitely talking in that larger sense, too, that at the end of time, and that's where he ends, uh, verse 32. You know, you all know God's decree uh, that, that all of you deserve to die. Um, you know, that, 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 this is, that you will all get punished eventually by God. So, so homosexuality along with slanderers and gossipers and everything else is going to be, is going to be something that'll be punished at the end of time. But it was the homosexuality that they really were against was homosexual relationships that I consider rape, that the older person is, is having sex with a child. So this is where the argument goes then, is okay. that, uh, is that is that all these things are relational things that are selfish that, uh, you know, remember we, we said what are the broad categories and they're relational and they're selfish. They're, they, 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 they look at the goodness of just yourself before the goodness of others. And, uh, and Paul's using homosexuality in that way because that's how Paul understood homosexuality in his day. And, and, and that's how he understood. Um, and also that Paul's made this larger argument, like I said, just on the, on the beauty of creation. And, and homosexuality challenges that argument because it, be, be, because the way that God made us doesn't seem to be the way that we're living that out. So, so it helps. It makes us ask other questions about how God made us. And, and, and you know, some of science is, is revealing some of how that might be, and, and, and culturally too, culturally too, how it is. So, 
Yeah. So so that so that's Paul. So Paul can't. All I'm saying is Paul can't imagine God blessing two men having sex together. That's it's completely beyond Paul's imagination. Paul can't imagine it because how he sees it lived out in his culture is horrific. And Paul thinks it's horrific. Other Jewish leaders think it's horrific. Greek leaders think it's horrific, right? And Paul can't imagine it too because it just doesn't make logical sense to him. Okay? And we can sympathize and empathize with all that. And so and, and, and so that, then you come to a question of um, then you come to a question of is, is um, do we get past this? Do we do, do, do we say that, uh, that 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 Paul's telling us how he believes God works in the world, and that Paul might have fallen short here, not by any sort of sinfulness, but simply by by being a first century teacher in in, in a Roman in a Greek Roman culture, or that Paul's being inspired here to tell us clearly, no matter what the world's trying to tell you about homosexuality, you can just read Paul, you know, who gave us the gift of understanding Jesus to say, to say this, this is, uh, uh, this is wrong. And so that's, and so that, this kind of hinges on this debate. And the problem is, and the problem is, is that Paul's opening argument, where he's talking about how our, our, our relationships of self have, have created this distorted world, <laughs> uses homosexuality as its, as its evidence one. <laughs> and so it's a hard one to walk away from. It's not just Paul, like if you wanted to make a case that slandering is okay, well, you could probably make an easier case just because slandering is just thrown in a few lists here and there. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, but, and, and it's never really talked about what is slandering, what is not slandering. I don't know if that's a great example, but 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 this is something that Paul's dived this dives into a little bit. So it gets a harder one to it gets a harder one if you're trying to make a new case for a new way of being in relationship and for a new way of seeing. So that's so um so I know Wally Taylor, who I had in the 1990s as a professor, he wrote the article for the ELCA that we read and then I reread. We read back in 2004 that I reread for today's class. Wonderful short article, just on well, it was a long article because it was on every one of the scriptures, but it was a short article on this one. And um, and in the 90s, he said, "I can't say to you in good conscience that I think Paul's got this wrong." You know that uh, that that's where he was in the 90s. He said, "I I I hope that's the case, but I can't say that." And by the 2000s, uh, by 10 years later, he was saying, you know, it, it, it feels like it feels like there's there, there, there's just more that God wants us to know about sexuality than Paul could have known in the first century. And and, and, and I'm, I'm prepared to I'm prepared to embrace people uh, and that, that come at this in a different way. So 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 even Wally Taylor evolved on this in the midst of the Lutherans. So um. So that so that's so we're in that kind of evolution, and uh, some of our Christian brothers and sisters would say that we're on the wrong end of that evolution. That we are that we are kowtowing to the culture too much, and that we're allowing the culture to tell us that something that is so obviously wrong, right? You got a penis, you got a vagina. If you go right there, right? obviously this is how God intended. Uh, that that just shows how far off you are from God's hope and God's intention. And what, and what Lutherans, and what most Lutherans would respond, I, I don't want to say the whole ELCA church, because the ELCA church was not responsible for this, but what most Lutherans now in the, in the ELCA, because after 2009, we had about 10% of our churches leave us, who, who didn't want to say something like this. So most of us who stayed church-wise, not member-wise, but church-wise, are saying that uh, uh, that it appears at least possible, and uh, if not probable. Uh, that, 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 that sexuality is much more complicated than we thought it was. And just like an eye is put together in crazy sort of pieces that we're still unfolding now, our sexuality is, 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 is put together in ways that we're still unfolding now. So there you go. So that's where we're at. Carol? I'm curious. Uh, you talked about this in the early 2000s with the deep dive into Scripture 
a Lutheran church to look at homosexuality. Was that done to do with the role of women, to decide what women's roles could be in the church? Do you know? Uh, I was reading Lois's. So, so start over again, I apologize. Lo Lois is laughing that we were making fun of her. She's cutting her foot off now. So she's <laughs> this, was there a deep dive into scripture at some point to look at the role of women to decide what the role of women could be in the church? Yeah, so the role of women, this is interesting. So that was in the early 70s. Okay. <clears throat> and, um, and, and again, and so, the, and so in, the, in the early 70s, they did a lot of a deep dive on on women as part of, again, so one nice thing I think about being Lutheran is, is, is that we believe, we believe that God speaks through our culture too, that, that, that we are, that, that doesn't mean that everything our culture is telling us is, is godly, just like everything Carol's telling me isn't godly, <laughs> you know, that, that, that there's, that there's goodness and curses in the midst of everything, there's saints and sinners in the midst of everything. But just because it's coming from the culture doesn't mean that it's something that we need to be suspicious of or, or, or dismiss. Okay, that God's in the midst of our brokenness is another way of saying that. So yeah, so another cultural issue that came up was was feminism in the '60s and so in the '70s, and they they, they did some deep dives on that, and um, and so they started looking at these pastoral letters. That, that's what those are called. Um, Jude and First Timothy and Second Timothy, um, and uh, the ones that are, they're called pseudo Paul letters. Paul probably didn't write them, but some somebody in the next generation after Paul probably did. And they're the ones who give all the kind of commandments against women of doing a lot of things. And then they started weighing those against the earliest letters, where Paul seems to have women leaders that he's talking about that are leading the churches that Paul's a part of. And that uh, Paul even calls one of the women a, a disciple or an apostle, which is crazy sort of language. And uh, and then we even look at Paul at, at Jesus's band of merry men. And, and uh, you know, and the women seem like the only ones who got their crap together in the midst of Jesus's stories. So it feels like first generation might have had a radical view of women in society compared and by the second and third generation, they were calming it down a little bit and saying, this is really what the church decided. That, that it looks like 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy is the church two, three generations from Jesus saying, you know what, our grandfathers, they were a little crazy with allowing women to talk and, you know, and uh, coming to church without coverings on their head. And, and, and so... We know for sure that what they were prescribing in First and Second Timothy looked like Roman culture in the second century. And what is described in the Gospels at the end of the first century, looking back on Jesus in you know the twenties, does not look like Jewish or Roman culture at all. And so, and, and so, so the church said that that um, that we. We've probably accepted the culture too much about women and culture, and, and that we need to be we need to be different. And so, fem, and so, so that was the kind of the response. And so we we took off all prescriptions then for what women could and couldn't do in the church. They were still around in the early seventies. Were there not women leaders in the church prior to the seventies? The there was not an ordained pastor until 1974, I think, which I was only 10, so I don't remember that date exactly, but yeah, no, there wasn't. Okay. Yeah, and then, um, right, and... Uh, oh, I know still on the Wisconsin Synod, uh, when our previous church, women weren't even allowed to read scripture. I was the first woman in the Church to ever read a piece of scripture in front of the mm -hmm. congregation. Yeah. There was some. Wow. Yeah. And it didn't catch fire or anything. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so, and so what we feel, and again, and what I think ELCA Lutherans feel pretty confident in saying is, is, that, is that that sort of patriar patriarchalism that, 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 that is evidence in our society 
uh, might not be God's intention for the kingdom of God. And, uh, and, 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 we want, and, and we want to be closer to the kingdom of God than the kingdom of man. And we're living out kingdom of man stuff by that, I think is maybe different language. Yeah, so that would be a different... But we're also 40 years away from that argument, right? I mean, we had very little discussion here, and it's time to go. We had very little discussion here when we called Pastor Liz about whether we wanted a female pastor. Right? I mean, it wasn't... It, and it was hard, I know, for a lot of us to engage with a female pastor just because, you know, pastors have always been old white men here at Messiah, and, you know, and now we've got a young, uh, a young woman. And, and, you know, that, that's not what I imagined. When I close my eyes and picture a pastor, it's not that what I imagined. So it was challenging for us, but people were willing to be challenged. Um, and, and, and then it was freeing for others. I, I could, I'll, I'll end with this story. We had um, Easter, like Ash Wednesday, somebody invited their, um, it was one of our members, she has friends who are nuns, and she invited her nun friends to come to our Easter Ash Wednesday service, and these four beautiful women who were probably in their 60s, I'm guessing, they were gathered around Liz crying afterwards because they were so moved. Because she led the entire service. Yeah, I didn't do I didn't do anything except pass out ashes because I'm lazy. So um so she yeah, they were just so moved that someone was not only in a robe, in a stole, preaching and, and leading communion, but they were also in command of the space. And it was uh and, and, and they were weeping. They said this, they said, you know, I, I am glad we came today to see this. So yeah, so it was just it was just really moving for them, and, I, and it was moving for me to see them moved. And I was glad I was lazy that day. <laughs> um, well, we're in there. Uh, Lois or uh, Kathy wants the last word. Oh, Kathy says, "Was that a Messiah, Kathy? I think you were raised a Messiah, right?" Mm-hmm. She said she wasn't allowed to be an acolyte when she no. was a kid. Only no. boys. Only boys. I wasn't either. Wow. Well, See, now we did have girl athletes when I was around, but that was in the 70s, not the 60s or 50s. 50s. The only boys were athletes. Ah, there you go. There you well, go. I left the church during the 60s and 70s because of anti- Because of this stuff, yeah. We didn't so. come back to church for a lot of years. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, well, I, already, I think, just in 11 years, since 2009, 12 years, you know, I mean, I, I think just our... our Ability just to be more relaxed about sexuality in our conversations is is probably evidence of you know that we're we're probably going to continue on this road. Okay, one well, there. Thanks, guys. Let's close with the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks for being with us.